just a huge thanks to the folks here at the Pathways Conference. You guys rock every year, and it's, every year just gets better and better. So thank you so much for inviting me, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I am uh, going to take us on a little bit of a journey, um, just a bit back into the past. I started as an intern. How many here are interns? Is there any interns in the room? Not too many? Oh, gosh. They're the lifeblood of this work, <laughs> so um, at least the gophers. But I started off as an intern for the Central Idaho Wolf Recovery Steering Committee, and there were five, six different government agencies, including the Nez Perce Tribe, that were my boss. And so I learned very quickly the difference between the Idaho State Fish and Game, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Bureau of Land Management, the Forest Service, uh, Wildlife Services, and all the different roles in between on, on those as well. My job was to go out and help document whether wolves were in Idaho or not. Idaho had lost its wolf population around the 1930s uh, due to poisoning, trapping, shooting. Uh, the animosity towards wolves was very strong at that time and there was also a government program uh, that included bounties on wolves to try to get rid of them. So they were completely eradicated from Idaho by that time, but then in the 1970s, as wolves were starting to make their way back into northwestern Montana, we had a few wolves that did disperse from Canada that made it into Idaho. And we kept getting reports over and over again of a pack of wolves up in a place called Bear Valley. Has anybody been to Bear Valley, Idaho? Yeah, okay, well how about the Frank Church River of No Return Wilderness? Because it's right on the border of that area. It's beautiful. And so uh, on the, my way back from doing a flight um, out to look at wolf habitat with Dr. Steve Fritz, who was the head of the Fish and Wildlife Service wolf program at the time, we had covered the central Idaho area and we were out um, uh, you know, flying through this over this wilderness. So I was on the ground that evening trying to, to uh, document what we had received in terms of reports that day that somebody had videotaped wolves in the area. So. I have done a lot of howling surveys. Normally, we didn't hear anything. Sometimes one team would come in and we'd be all excited and wait till the next team comes in and they'd come in and they'd be all excited. We heard wolves howling. We heard wolves howling too. Um, and then we point to the map and realize we've been howling to each other. So yeah, fun stuff. So um, I, had, uh, I had pulled up and, and driv driven into the, the back country there up a pretty long dirt road into the Frank Church area up to Bear Valley. And I stopped at the place where they had filmed the wolves, or thought they had. It looked like fuzzy coyotes to us, we weren't quite sure. And started setting up stuff to, to, uh, to, to howl for them. Um, I had howled a few times before, uh, once with, with Dr. Fritz, and, and that time the answer we got back was, rifle bullets, whistle zinging right over our heads. So I was learning how to perfect the idea of maybe howling behind trees, um, and, and I was um, out by myself. So anyway, if we can uh, turn off the lights, I'm gonna take us back into that trip and get us started here. So imagine you're in the back country, it's near dusk, like this, and there's crickets going, the moon's starting to rise, a little glow on the horizon. Um, and I found my tree, so I could howl behind it, and did my first two howls. And you're welcome to howl with me, there's some good howlers in the room. listened and waited. I usually wait a few minutes, maybe five or ten. Just the wolves can hear from a long way away. We can't. So sometimes they respond and we can't even hear them howling back. But then I gave up about 20 minutes later and started putting my camp together. And as the moon, moon was rising, back behind us, um, Suddenly, the forest just filled with this amazing sound I had never heard before.
started taping them. You can hear me cussing a little bit on the thing because I'm trying to find the button. I'm crying. But that question of where are you has finally, finally been answered. We found wolves. We had a whole pack. In fact, that howling, I was able to listen to them howl, and then as they kind of died down in their howling, um, I held back to them, thinking, hey, this, you know, that's what you do. You, you say hello, they say hello, we say hello back, right? Um, and at one point, I remember the, one of the deep-voiced older wolves, and they must have been within, I don't know, 50 feet. Um, we were howling back and forth with each other. And as he would howl or she would howl and the voice would die down, I would overlap, you know, like you hear them do, because they're, uh, they love that overlapping rhythm. And then suddenly there was this, you know, uh, a warning bark. And I couldn't hear it, but they did, that there was a truck coming down the road quite a, quite a long ways off. You know, and I kept howling, and they were probably thinking, you dummy, you need to be <laughs> hiding from more than just a tree. Um, Anyway, um, but we finally found our first pack of wolves, and that was in 1991. If you're counting the wolf reintroduction, that would happened in 1995, that was years before, yes? Well, unfortunately, we found one of the wolves from that, and the rest of them disappeared, and the one that we found was poisoned with a chemical called furidan. It's a neurotoxin. And I was the one to find her, so I was really lucky I didn't get it on me, because it is extremely deadly. Um, and she died from it. We were able to air rescue her out of there, but not in time to um, revive her. And then the rest of the pack disappeared. And that happened over and over again for decades, um, losing these wolves. They were getting killed as they came into the state of Idaho. So, in retrospect of all of that, we realized that that old attitude towards wolves was still very much with us, um, and that that wasn't going to change just on its own. So, let's see. There we go. So, 1995, 1996 rolls around. We get the wolf reintroduction. Uh, half the wolves pretty much go to Yellowstone, and the other half are uh, released in Idaho. I was up in the Yellowstone area um, for the, the capture of the second year. I was on the ground for the releasing the wolves for the first, uh, during the first year. And uh, it was pretty exciting to be there. Um, it was uh, uh, the first year a really well-organized operation. Um, the second year, we had our funding pulled six weeks before the wolf reintroduction was supposed to occur. Congress came in, members of Congress decided to pull all the funding, and we had that short of a time to, to uh, restore the funding, which we did by going to private donors. We sent out a mailing that went to a couple thousand people. And some of those kids that donated sent us their pocket money, and it all added up to $100,000 that helped us do the wolf reintroduction the second year. So if you're considering wolf reintroduction in Colorado, I'm going to guess that you're not going to have to face what we did in quite a few terms. In fact, you can learn from quite a few of our mistakes because we were doing it without a model. You have a model, which is pretty important when you get the opportunity to evaluate how you would restore wolves here to Colorado. I'll bet you're not going to go as far north as uh, northern British Columbia to Fort St. John. I bet you won't do it when the temperatures are 30 below as the warmest temperature. It got down to 50 below, too. When it was 50 below, our helicopters weren't working. Uh, when it was 35 to 40 below, we had to wait for a few days to get past the 50 below. Um, the darts were freezing in midair, so we had to buy out everybody in town. All the stores had to buy out their, their heating elements for warming up our darts. Our, our folks suffered through, and most, yeah, most of the people were volunteers because we didn't have enough money to pay people that year. So we lost a few things like uh, some frostbite on fingers and stuff. One guy lost a toe, um, but the dedication was there. You probably won't have to rely on a whole bunch of volunteers like we did, and some of them were pretty young. We actually uh, had volunteers come in from the local school. So it operated like a mass unit, and often kind of by the seat of our pants uh, because of, uh, of the, the lack of funding and uh, 
just the urgency that if we didn't do it that second year, we may not have the opportunity to ever do it again. Uh, they were supposed to happen for three years. We only were able to do it for two before we were stopped from, um, and actually two was enough. We had amazing veterinarians, and I'm sure you will hear as well. They were incredibly hardworking and talented, and we uh, only lost one wolf during the reintroduction, and it was an accidental situation, um, but we were, the rest of them did beautifully. Uh, we were lucky to have the Nez Perce tribe come and do a blessing ceremony for the wolves. It worked so well that one of our wolves lived to be 13 in the wild, and that's pretty much a record for wolves in the wild, at least in Idaho. We had to care for the wolves and in very tough conditions, and the wolves did beautifully. They were used to 30 below zero. It was the humans that weren't. <laughs> so we decorated the radio collars that our school kids did, and then they tracked the wolves afterwards um, so that they could monitor the wolves uh, and you know, learn from where they went. We were all learning. You probably won't have to snowmobile uh, facing threats of violence and uh, avalanche dangers. Uh, I think you'll probably have it easier and you'll probably have better cages than we did. Those were pretty much thrown together, but they worked. This is the Idaho wolf reintroduction. This is one of the females from the Pioneer Pack. She's the alpha female, the pack that established in our area. Um, she and her pups survived, and, and wolves are still surviving in that area because all the non-lethal tools and methods that we've been able to develop since having wolves on the ground. You will have all of those as uh, tools in your toolbox when wolves get here, and we can't wait to learn from some of the things that you create to help us do a better job at managing wolves in our area, managing conflicts, really. So someday, I'm hoping that I'm going to bring my kids here to Colorado and, uh, and be able to hear the same thing that I waited a long time to hear in Idaho, the howls of wolves filling the forest here, um, the sound of wildness, and the species belongs here in Colorado, and this is a state that they desperately need to be in. They deserve to be here. So I'm hoping this is some, someday soon we will be seeing these guys looking back and finding their way here, whether it's through wolf reintroduction, which I felt like worked extremely well for Idaho. We would have done things very differently in a few ways, but overall the success has been amazing seeing wolves restored, seeing them recover, not only in Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming, but also in now Oregon, Washington, and California. It's pretty incredible. And that's only less than 25 years. So thank you. I appreciate your listening, and, uh, and I don't know if we're doing questions yet, but I appreciate your time. Thank you. <laughs>